Hey world, you're listening to Globe Thotter, the pod that puts the lover in travel lover. I'm your host, Cassie Martinez, and each week I trade tales with a slew of amazing adventurers who, like me, kiss and tell. Before jumping into this episode, I wanted to share some huge news. Globe Thotter's first ever group trip is officially going down this spring. And yep, we're going to Portugal, baby. That's right, I'm going to be taking you to where it all started for me. Lisbon, my first ever solo travel city. From there, we'll be making our way down to Lagos, Portugal, where if you've listened to the pod, you know I spent a wild summer volunteering at the Rising Cock, one of Europe's most notorious party hostels. Over the next coming weeks, I'm putting together our week-long itinerary chock full of nights sure to be competing as the best night you've ever had. And the best part is, I want you in on the planning process with me to ensure this trip has your DNA all over it. To ensure your voice is heard as I plan our little getaway, be sure to join the Globe Thotter Facebook group to vote in key polls regarding trip dates and activities you're down to do. Once the itinerary is set, Facebook group members will be the first to know all the details so they can snag one of the coveted spots on the trip right away. Not only Group Trip Headquarters, Globethotter's Facebook group is a private space to ask travel questions, swap stories, and meet up with other adventurers on your wavelength. Find the link to join the group in this episode's description, or by simply searching Globethotter Travel Gang on Facebook. Major update aside, I'm so excited for you guys to meet our soulful guest today on the VOD, Brie Ari. An award-winning writer, Brie describes herself as a traveling poet, a word alchemist, and unapologetically black. When not busy concocting delicious cocktails with her sister as one part of poetic potions in the DMV, Brie can be found roaming the world with her poetry notebook in hand as one of the founders of Buoyant Travel, a community made for black travelers by black travelers. So buckle up because you're not gonna wanna miss Brie's story of finding love at first sight in Ghana, as well as her boy is mine moment in Italy. And she's not just spilling the tea on her amazing stories abroad. Bree's also sharing with us her tried and true tips for grounding yourself while traveling, even in the middle of a go, go, go itinerary. And be sure to hang with us until the end of our chat to listen as Bree reads one of her poems for us that just radiates globe butter energy. So let's get into it, shall we? So everybody, welcome. We're back with another episode of Globe Thotter, the pod that puts the lover in travel lover. I'm here today with such a scrumptious guest. I'm so excited. Brie Ari, aka the traveling poet. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing fabulous now that you're in my Zoom presence. But you guys, Brie Ari is a traveling poet that is an award-winning traveling writer. She's a poet, she's a cocktail alchemist, and you can see her stories on travel, food, and wellness. And you can read them in Fodor's Travel, Matador Network, Seeker, and Pop Sugar, just to name a few. Aside from her writing, Brie is one part of Poetic Potions events, which we've just got to talk about. It's a sister duo that crafts cocktails in the DMV and actually also does virtual classes to help you up your cocktail game. Aside from that, Brie is also one of the founders behind Buoyant Travel, a black travel community that is designed to connect you with cool folks all across the diaspora. They're currently curating a cannot miss New Year's Eve group trip to Ghana, so definitely get in on that while you can. All that aside, let's get into it. Tell us a bit about yourself, Brie. Where are you from? Yeah, so I'm from Baltimore, as we would say, Baltimore (laughs) in Maryland. That's where I was born, mostly raised. I lived in Pennsylvania for a little bit, went to college there. But Baltimore is like my hometown, and that's where I live now. I love it. I love it. And tell us about the last trip that you've taken. What's one word to describe it? Hmm... I would say, I'm going to just say summer. Because this was a really great summer. And the whole trip was just giving all summer vibes. Yes. And it's my favorite time of year. Me It's very tropical. too. Where did you go? <laughs> so this wasn't my last trip, but this is the first trip that I thought of. So I was like, I'm going to just say it. I went to Puerto Rico in June. And it was my last tropical trip. And it was very fun. 
And yeah, I was in San Juan and then I also went to a place called Isabella. And I just love Puerto Rico. So I talk about it any chance I can get. <laughs> yes, yes. I know the feeling. And I am such a summer gal as well. I do most of my trekking, traveling in the summer, but your girl also loves the off season. I think there's something nice about the off season because all the typical tourists are gone and it's just you and the cute locals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. My actual last trip was like London and Paris. And I guess it technically wasn't off season, but it was kind of starting to creep up. It was like uh, starting to get into September. And it was just like a nice chill vibe. I know it's COVID anyway, but neither city seemed to be like super touristy or super packed like they have been in the past. So it was nice. I love it. I love it. (laughs) So tell us about your journey to becoming an award-winning traveling poet. Yeah. So this is so cliche, but I feel like I've always been like a writer and a poet. um, But I've been like seriously writing since I was like first year of college maybe so like 18 19 I got my little heart broken and I started writing poems about it and it's been a rap ever since (laughs) and then somewhere along the way I started travel blogging it started as like a food and travel thing or mostly as a food thing and it turned into travel after I studied abroad and yeah about two years ago I started writing for different publications because I really wanted to not just write for my own blog I wanted to like make this a professional thing and yeah in 2020 I won an award for one of those pieces and it was actually about Baltimore so that made me happy and yeah now I'm just out here trying to do both be a poet and a travel writer (laughs) I love it I love it what's one piece of advice you would give to aspiring travel writers out there Mm, yeah I would say the most like practical piece of advice because a lot of people find it like really hard to get into and it's very like whitewashed like everything so my most like practical piece of advice is literally to go on twitter i used to be like not hanging in the twitter streets but that's where a lot of like freelance writing gigs are and so now yeah now i follow a bunch of editors from different travel magazines and they put out calls for pitches all the time Um, And that's where I find most of my work. So I feel like it's a little, not a well-known thing, unless you're a writer, so. Totally, totally. The writing community, Twitter is where it's at. And by following these editors, like you're saying, you can be in there first. I love it. So you've traveled many places with your writing notebook. I want to hear what is the most surreal place you've found yourself inspired to write, where you've pulled out your pen and had that big pinch me moment. Yeah, so you kind of mentioned Ghana earlier, Mm -hmm. and I'm probably going to keep on talking about Ghana for the rest of the time. (laughs) But um, (laughs) basically, I went to Ghana in 2019. It's my first time ever going to an African country. And as an African-American, like with no ties to any place outside of the States, it was just like a very moving trip. It was also really 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 fun because in 2019 I don't know if you if you know it was considered the year of return so it was been 400 years then um, in 2019 since the first um, enslaved people were brought to the Americas specifically Virginia and so Ghana has always kind of been a place that's a lot of Americans go to a lot of celebrities and stuff over the years as like refuge outside of the states specifically in Africa West Africa So yeah, it was just like an amazing time to be there. I'm so glad I went. And I remember literally pulling out my notebook multiple times because usually I kind of wait until I get home and kind of like reflect. But like stuff was just hitting me while I was there. It was very surreal. Wow, the downloads. I can imagine just being there in that place. Yeah, it's it's like a, a feeling that I honestly can't describe. Maybe that's why I need to keep going back so I can find the words. Um, I've been going back every year since. And it's just a truly magical place. And it's even more magical as a Black person who lives and has always lived in a white majority country to go somewhere, look around, and everybody looks like you. Like, there's no... I mean, until you open your mouth and obviously are American in the clothes and stuff too. But like just visually, it's no other feeling like right. that. So. Yeah, totally. You know, it reminds me a little bit about, you know, my return to Mexico. I live in Texas. I'm on obviously the American side of the border. And in the past, you know, year and a half have really for the first time been going in deep into, you know, my home country, you know? And there really is 
like no other feeling like that, connecting to the source, you know, and really looking around and being like, these are my people. And it's a very interesting, beautiful, beautiful feeling. And the downloads, like we were saying, that come to you, the writing that comes to you, you know, when you bring together like the spiritual side, your writing side, and you throw that in with a little globe thoughting. Are you kidding? <laughs> are you it's kidding? It's a beautiful mix. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> So in one of your poems, you write that we're all just travelers on a journey to find a place or a person that feels like home. I'd love to hear a destination that just felt like home to you on site. Tell us about that feeling. Yeah, I'm gonna say Ghana, but I'll add another one too. But Ghana for sure, again, for all of the reasons I just mentioned, like on site, as soon as I got there, I was like, what's up? I'm never leaving. (laughs) Um, And that's why I keep going back. Also... This sounds like maybe kind of weird, but I kind of feel the same way about London. I actually lived there, though, so I don't know if it was an on-site thing or if it kind of just happened over time. But I feel like I loved it as soon as I got there. Obviously, there's like some comfortability there. English-speaking country, like big, you know, Western country or whatever. But I don't know. It's just something I really love about London. And I get really, really annoyed when people say like how London is you know just another big city it's kind of bland blah blah blah. but when you tap into like the black culture there it's like no other it's not I don't know I can't explain it but it feels like home yeah yeah for sure those folks are in the wrong side of London baby sorry exactly I one time went to this place called steam down oh it's not a place it's an event and I still get their texts every week and I'm like dang I wish I could go but I read an article about it and I went. The way they described it in the article, they say is literally like church and the gym at the same time. The gym, because you be sweating. <laughs> and church, because it's like a live music experience and people are just so like free there. And it was just so cool. It's live music. They do like a mix of jazz and hip hop. And I just feel like maybe you can get that in another city. But like, it's just so particular to London for me. People really appreciate live music there, I think. Yes, the energy, the cultures, all the different backgrounds and diversity blending together. It all tells a story, just creates an energy in a room that is none other. That is so cool. Yeah, exactly. Amazing. (laughs) Now to get to the second juicy part of the poem about finding a person that feels like home. Have you ever met someone while traveling that just felt like home to you? Where and when, baby? Let's get into it. (laughs) <laughs> yes. Yeah, so um I'm just dropping that I'm a Pisces. So Pisces gang. Almost everybody <laughs> are you a Pisces too? No, I just love them. Oh some of my besties. <laughs> oh, yeah. Some of my besties. Bloop bloop Pisces. Yes. <laughs> um yeah, so I just be feeling like everybody is home and everywhere is home. But I had a very particular experience in Ghana last year in 2020. And honestly, Not to be dramatic, I feel like it was love at first sight. For me, at least. I don't know about for homeboy, but for me, it was. (laughs) Like, basically, should I tell the story? Get into it. Let's do it. You can't just leave us with, (laughs) it felt like love at first sight, and then we skip. (laughs) So basically, um, I had, I was on Instagram, and I was looking for a restaurant to go to that night for dinner, and... Um, I found a place. It was near my hotel. And I was just scrolling through Instagram. And then there was this guy on there. And he is like a performer. And I think he had performed at the restaurant maybe like a few days or weeks before. And I was like, mm, he fine. So I clicked on it. <laughs> and I followed him. And I just like honestly didn't think anything of it. I was just like, oh, he's cute. He's in Accra. Like, I'm going to just follow him. And I just went on about my day. And then he followed me back. And you know, once they follow you back, then you're like, ooh. <laughs> so again I was like cute but I still like almost didn't really think anything of it I watched this story I'm like cool later I'm at a cafe working and he messaged me on Instagram and said hey um I think I see you at I was at this place called like coconut something it was a cafe he said I see you I'm here I'm here too like I see you through the window I'm just trying to make sure if it's you and then I saw the message but like I didn't want to look like I was like looking around <laughs> it was a small place so I like didn't open it for like two minutes which is dumb I- <laughs> <laughs> let him wait yes I was like acting like I was still working then I opened it and I was just like hey yeah I'm here too but I don't see you I was outside he was inside 
he was like, I'm doing like an interview or something right now, but I'll say hi before I leave. And I'm like, okay, cool. Okay, the cafe is about to close in like 30 minutes. So we running out of time. I'm still sitting there acting like I'm working, but girl, I've been done working, but I'm waiting for him to come outside. (laughs) And I was almost about to leave, but I called my friend and she told me not to. So I just stayed. The restaurant is literally kicking us out. He finally walks out. I'm on my computer. I look up from my computer and then we like lock eyes. And he's just like the most beautiful man I ever saw. He was like, hi, I'm his name. And then we shook hands. And I, when I tell you, again, the Pisces thing, I, we were shaking hands. I heard his name. And then I really was just thinking about like our whole life together mm-hmm. after that. You saw it. <laughs> <laughs> I saw it. And I feel like I fall, not fall in love, but like I fall... I don't I don't have an issue with like feeling things, but I never like looked at someone and was just like, damn, I want to know everything about you. And that's how I felt when I saw him. So anyway, I messaged him a little bit after that on Instagram and I said, it was nice to meet you, but it was too brief. My friend had to coach me to say that because I wasn't going to say it. Um, And we met up later for a drink and we talked and yeah. It was cool. He has a girlfriend, which he ended up telling me at the thing. She's fine with him meeting, like, new people and stuff. But it, it never, like, turned into the, anything after that. I don't know if he still got a girlfriend, so. Got to check up on your investment. <laughs> I'm going check, to check up on it this year. But, yeah, I think that was the first time that I felt like, I don't know. Just that comfort. Would you, you said, like. Feeling yeah, at home. Yeah, just immediately. Right. Yeah. You know, I think it is a testament to your storytelling ability that when you mentioned he had a girlfriend, my heart fell to the floor. I was so crestfallen, Brie, for you. For us. That's how I felt (laughs) for us. That's how I felt when he said it. I'm like, everything is lining up. And then he said it and I was like, okay, but you know what? I actually, I wrote about this a little bit after the experience. I did feel, naturally, I felt a little, like, taken aback when he said he had a girlfriend. But I actually remember not feeling like, oh, like, I didn't feel defeated because it was so genuine. Like, I literally looked at him, saw my whole future, (laughs) and we sat down and had a nice, like, drink and a great conversation. And, like, it was nothing to be devastated about, you know? Oh, yes. You touched on so many positive points, too, about the globe-thudding lifestyle of, like, one— It doesn't always have to lead somewhere like extremely romantic, sexual. Like it was still also just like a really beautiful meeting of two souls in a cafe in a beautiful place in Ghana. I'd literally be preaching that your connections don't have to follow this like cookie cutter, monogamous, we're forever kind of love. It's tough for me too. Like, you know, even just the word love, we're so trained to only say it after X amount of months too, and we'd be dating each other. And um, you know what? You can have a moment like that. You can have a day. You can meet someone romantically, platonically in your traveling adventures, have such a moment together and be like, I have love for you. Wow. What just happened was full of love. And how can I say that? Because I love you is only reserved for, you're my boyfriend, you're my girlfriend, you're whatever to me. Yes. That's a good point. I always think about that, but I never know how to, I guess, express it. Right. Yes. We're lacking the words. We're lacking the words. And, you know, within that, you briefly talked about how you used your writing to kind of sift through your emotions. Have you ever had that experience while traveling too, when, you know, you're just trying to make sense of what just happened to you and your writing, your poetry, is that outlet for you? Yeah, it's definitely an outlet. I bring a notebook on every trip. I literally forgot one on my last trip to Paris and London. And I was like, what kind of writer am I? (laughs) But I just wrote stuff down in my phone. But it's definitely an outlet. Like, I bring it with me and it's there for me to reflect and remember. And yeah, just really detail how things, how my life is going. And it's like a nice, I do it at home too, but it's nice when you're traveling because it just allows you to get out of your, I mean, it allows you to be more present while you're there. And so, yeah, I use writing as a tool while I'm traveling. I love that. And you touched on the fact that, you know, travel can be very go, 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 right? We're moving all the time. The first few weeks of a long-term trip for me, which is how I prefer to travel, I feel like my feet aren't even on the ground, right? I'd love to hear how you ground yourself through traveling. You know, you've got your pen and paper, but, you know, the rituals that really kind of keep you centered, 
Yeah, so basically, I've been meditating on and off for like a few years. I rarely stick to it, but for some reason, when I go on a trip, it's a bit easier to stick to. So I just try to have a morning routine wherever I go because that helps me feel grounded and it helps me feel not so all over the place and go, 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 like you said. So I usually just try to wake up without an alarm. I'm not trying to wake up to a a blaring alarm. (laughs) And I do some type of meditation or stretching and just like quiet moments. And then sometimes I'll write in the morning. If I don't think I'll write throughout the day, I'll try to write through the morning. And that's really it. I'm a big get up and watch the sunrise person. Like I love sunsets and I know everybody loves sunsets, but when I'm traveling, I will get up at the crack of dawn to watch the sunrise. I just think it's so therapeutic. So yeah, I think that's really all I do, but it does help me feel grounded wherever I am. Aside from writing, you were also one of the founders behind Boy and Travel, a community which curates group trips and meetups around the world specifically for Black travelers. Tell me about the inspiration behind your company. How has it evolved over the years? Yeah, so basically when I was a senior, was I a senior? Oh, yeah, a senior in college. Do you remember the show Shark Tank? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so my school basically had its own version of Shark Tank, uh, like a Shark Tank business pitch competition. And yeah, I was an entrepreneurship minor. And so like we had to do it at first. I did not want to do it. I was like so mad that I had to do it because I'm kind of um, a little fake shy. Like I just it takes me a time to warm up. And um, so I was like nervous about the public speaking, but I did it. It was great. I got second place. So it gave me a little bit of just encouragement to actually do it. And yeah, it's evolved over the years. It kind of started as me just planning individual trips for people. And I will still do that, but I'm more so about trying to build the community, doing meetups and group trips. So Ghana in 2019 was actually our first trip. This year will be the second time since we didn't go in 2020. And I want to do other trips to places that I really love and know well. So London, maybe some Puerto Rico, and yeah, who knows where next, but group trips and then also meetups. I've done one in like DC, New York, London. I really just like like meeting new people when I go places, connecting with people that I've been following on Instagram for years and like we never get to meet up. So this gives us like a formal place to do it. And the world is kind of opening up a little bit again. So hopefully I can get back to doing some of those things. But yeah, it's a bit of a passion project. And I'm going to keep doing it because it's fun. (laughs) I love it. I love it. And how does your passion for cocktails and cocktail alchemy kind of play into the buoyant travel lifestyle? Yeah. So when I was in London, okay, so I'll go back. I went to London for the first time in 2016. It was the first time I left the States, all that jazz. I went to study abroad, of course, and went for a semester, came back home. And then in 2018, I was like, I'm not trying to do this adult stuff yet. So let me go to grad school. (laughs) So I went back to London, went to grad school. And while I was there, I learned how to bartend. I always wanted to learn. I was like, that's the time to do it. So I found this cute little bar. It was called Workers Dalston. It doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately. But it was a cute little neighborhood bar in East London. And yeah, I learned how to bartend there. And ever since then, I've just been like obsessed with cocktails. I didn't even used to think that I liked alcohol, but I just didn't know what I liked. Yeah. And since then, I've just been like working on my craft. It's one of the things that I love to do. And so me and my sister, right before the pandemic, started doing different little events around D.C., Maryland and Virginia. And during the pandemic, we were doing a lot of virtual cocktail classes. So, yeah, it's fun. And it fits into the lifestyle because everywhere I go, I'm looking for a good cocktail. (laughs) Right. I mean, I love how multi-hyphenate you are, like writer, poet, you know, travel entrepreneur, and you make a mean cocktail. You know, people always ask like, well, how do you put yourself out there if you're solo? It's like, honestly, take yourself to a bar and don't sit at a table, sit at the bar. Yep. Every time. It works like a charm because one, the alcohol is going to help loosen you up a little bit, give you a little bit of courage. It also gives you something to talk about immediately. Like, you can give a little compliment and then ask what they're drinking and it just opens opens the conversation. So I love cocktails. It's a huge part. Food and drink is like a huge part of travel for me. Oof. Well, so. you've got to drop your favorite cocktail spot to us, like say perhaps in London or, or what, what little cocktail bar out there in the world should people check out? So in London, there's a bomb place. There's like a nice vibe. Um, it's called High Water. 
It's in Dalston in East London. The best espresso martini. Ah, oh, so good. And I used to really love the Ace Hotel in London, but it closed and that made me so sad. Um, but I would say high water if you're in London. In DC, there's a place called the Eaton Hotel and there's a secret little speakeasy literally behind a bookshelf. Um, and they have great cocktails there too. And yeah, those are probably like my, my top two that I could think of right now. I love it. The espresso <laughs> martini. You had me there. i am be wired all night. Let's go. <laughs> yes. I love espresso martinis. Because the clubs don't <laughs> close in London till sunrise either. You talk about a sunrise. <laughs> right. You're going to be up and at them. And that's what the espresso martini is for. You need a little bit of liquor. You need a little bit of coffee. <laughs> uh, I love it. I love it. So while you're a seasoned solo travel, you aren't afraid of a little group trip as evidenced by buoyant travel. This New Year's, you're going to be headed back to Ghana to lead your second group with the company. And that itinerary, I'm not going to lie, it looks lit. Can you give us a rundown (laughs) of the trip? How did you put it all together? What was your process? Yeah, so fortunately, I did it before in 2019. That was kind of like my practice run. Um, I went back solo in 2020 to pick up some more like things I wanted to do for this year. And so I kind of combined those two experiences to make this year's and... Yeah, I do a little bit of what I did when I was there, a little bit of sourcing on Instagram. (laughs) And now that I've been a few times, I know people there. And so they gave me their input too on like, oh no, you should definitely do this or you should do that. And so yeah, we get a little bit of culture, nightlife. We're doing things culturally that are specific to Ghana, like going to the former enslavement castles there in Cape Coast. I think it's really important for everybody to go, but it's particularly important for Black American folks who've never been to the continent to go there. There's a place called the Door of No Return, and it's literally was meant to be a door. They said, once you go out of this door, you're never coming back. And it's such a powerful feeling to go back. So we do things like that. There's a bit of nature included. We go to like a national park that's really beautiful in Ghana. We definitely turn up. We go to a music festival called Afrochella. That's great. And then, yeah, a little sprinkle of this, like a city tour, lots of food, and yeah, the whole nine. And then we ring in New Year's, of course. So I love it. It sounds so well rounded and just so thoughtful. You guys, you got to get in on this. Check out Boy and Travel on IG. But on another note, I'm very curious has love ever sparked on these group trips between folks? We're, we're here on Globe Thoughter. We got to get into it. Spill the details. <laughs> yeah so besides me it's like um so mostly on the trips um like actually who's coming it ends up being which there can still be love but it ends up being a a lot of women I don't know why men don't be wanting to come on my trips but that's fine because we be looking at the men that's in the destination and um so one of the travelers that was with me I remember we had like went out or something And everybody was like, kind of like, you know, spotting who they wanted to talk to and, you know, all the girl chat was going on. And I remember her telling me like about some guy that she had met earlier that day um, and that he was like there and she didn't like make much of it. And I was just like, okay, cool. And basically I kept in contact with her and found out like a few months after the trip that they were a couple and they were together. And I got to meet him last year and they have this like a really cute vibe and energy. And even though he wasn't on the trip, they still met while she was in Ghana with me for Buoyant. So I feel a little bit responsible for the matchmaking. (laughs) Oh, 100%. 100%. I'll see you at that wedding. Right. Honestly, that reminds me of when I was volunteering for hostels, right? Like this was not an official duty by any means. But when I was leading those pub crawls, when I was walking in my purpose, (laughs) and I was taking people to the club every night in Spain and Portugal, one of my favorite things to do was matchmake travelers. Basically, you know, hey, dude from Australia, you should meet Brie. I think you guys would really get along. She <laughs> likes, you know, dancing. I think you like dancing too. Y'all should dance together. <laughs> but, oh my gosh, I love travel love. Clearly. <laughs> Clearly. But speaking of travel love, you've got a little story time for us mm-hmm. that takes place in Italy. Let's dive in, shall we? Yeah. So I think I mentioned earlier how um, I went to London It was in 2016 for the first time. I was studying abroad and me and my friends took our little coins and went on this very scrappy spring break. It was my first like Euro trip. So we like 
oh, these Ryanair flights, only $10. We going here, we going there. <laughs> and so we ended up going to Italy for most of the trip. And we were supposed to go to Greece. When we got there to Greece, me and one of my friends realized that like the coin wasn't going to stretch that far. Um, so <laughs> we went back to London, but our Italy time was great. And so, yeah, basically we went to a bunch of different cities, but we started in Rome and I was in charge of booking the Airbnb. I found it and I booked it. And <laughs> this was so long ago. So this was when you were trying to like, um, you know, get all your views and stuff on Airbnb. So I'm sending like all these nice messages to the host trying to get them to accept us. And one accepts us. And should I say his name? I feel like he's not going to listen to this. He'll never listen. I mean. I'm saying it. <laughs> Our host accepted us. His name is Marco, which is a very, like, Italian name, so that it could be anyone. Mm -hmm. And Marco accepted our request, and we were like, perfect. It was, like, our top choice place. So me and the girls get there. It's me and two of my friends. And we're staying for, like, five days. And it was this beautiful house. I forget the neighborhood it was in, but it was just given... It was given Italy. It was given Grandma Chic. Um, it was literally his grandmother's old flat. And so it just had that like cozy feel to it. There was literally like this cute yellow refrigerator. It had a balcony. The windows were wide and just like open and beautiful. And anyway, I still remember how it looks. There was pictures of his family on the wall. It was it was nice. And so we were just there loving it. And he would come and check on us like Every other day, he bought us wine because his family, I want to say it's his dad or maybe his granddad, but one of them is in the winemaking business. So he bought us like some real, I guess, exclusive, I don't know if it's exclusive wine. And it was great. And so oh my gosh. me and the girls both just commented or me and the other two girls both were commenting like how we thought he was so cute. He had like braces and this like boyish like innocence about him but he was still like oh my gosh <laughs> yeah he had the beard and the hair so he was still like grown man fine at the same time and so we were all just like gushing about it just being girls um and one of my friends was a little bold she's a pisces too she was like yeah i'm gonna say something to him like just talking a big game like mm -hmm. yeah, he gonna be mine by the end i'm like okay whatever and I'm a I'm a quiet killer, so I wasn't saying all that. I was just I knew in my head that like I didn't even have to compete with her. So <laughs> love it, love it. Y'all were having your own "the boy is mine" moment it was, out there. <laughs> it was very much so Brandy and Monica. And so <laughs> basically, the trip goes on. It's great. He keeps checking up on us. He's lovely. He's a great host. And it comes to the end of the trip. And we leave him a note. He had a wall where everybody can leave a note. And we just left a note saying, like, thank you so much. It was a great time. Thank you for the wine. And then my friend threw in, like, handsome at the end or something. Like, thanks, handsome. And we all signed it. But because I'm the one, the girl, your girl is the one who booked the Airbnb. So I flirted with him a bit in person before we left. We gave him hugs and said thank you. But when I got back to London, he texted me. And he was like, I hope you got back safe. And I was like, yeah, thank you so much. We had a great time saying thank you again. And then we just kept talking for like the next week. We were just like, how's London? How's Rome? Da, da, da. We kept in touch. And two months later, I went back to Rome by myself. My friends are already back in the States. I never mentioned this to them. Like, <laughs> if they ever hear this, they won't even know. But like, the boy was definitely mine. Um, <laughs> like I just didn't want to rub it in anybody's face, but it ended how it ended. It ended how it ended. So yeah, I went back to Rome, and um, we had a little two day romance. We like ordered sushi and watched a movie. Um, we walked around a little bit. Um, he had to work, so he would. We didn't spend like the whole day together or anything, but he like told me where I should go and gave me all the like cool little spots. And I ended up going on my first solo trip in that same trip. Um, so technically going to Rome was a solo trip, but I went to another part of Italy. It's about an hour away, hour and a half on the train. I couldn't afford Amalfi Coast. So I went to a place called Spirlonga. I literally Googled where to go if you can't afford Amalfi Coast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it was nice. It was beautiful. So I did like two days in Rome, went to Spirlonga, did like a day or two there, and then came back. But 
The travel rom- romance part is that now I have that connection with him. And every time I go to Italy, if you see me in Italy, if you see me in Rome, I'm probably with him. Uh, <laughs> you know whose arms you're in if yeah. you're in Rome. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, it's just nice. There's no, like... There's not, that's kind of like you were saying earlier, like there's no expectation for, for anything to turn into anything serious. Like we just enjoy each other every time I'm there and we keep in touch here and there. We don't talk too often and it's just nice. It's my little like Rome lover. (laughs) Yes. Yes. You are basically listing out the recipe for a globe thotting experience Mm -hmm. that doesn't end in heartbreak, Mm -hmm. you know? Honestly, like, don't take things too seriously. Stay in loose touch. You know, maybe follow each other on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Leave flame emojis here and there. Mm -hmm. Heart eyes. You know the deal. Mm -hmm. And you won't get your heart broken. Honestly. (laughs) Exactly. It's a great recipe. Like, I wish it was easier to follow this recipe, like, at home when dating at home. But for some reason, there's always... When I'm dating in the States, it just always feels like there's... Maybe I'm putting the pressure or... It's just our culture here. But it just always feels like it has to turn into something. Oof. So. Yeah. 100%. 100%. And I love the point that you brought up of like, I don't know. I mean, I know my part to play in this. I know we all play this role in putting the pressure on each other that just is not there Mm -hmm. with travel love. Like, you really couldn't look at Marco and be like, well, what are we? (laughs) <laughs> date three what are we you know like right. it's that dance that is just so unsexy back at home yeah you know oof yeah you're telling it but honestly i loved that story i loved how you know not no pressure put on each other you just go our separate ways and you've got that connection next time you said you in rome you know who to hit up you know what what's up number to dial <laughs> and that's what it's all about yeah it's nice So to close things off, I would love if you shared with us one of your poems that when I read it, it honestly just radiated globe thought or vibes. (laughs) Would you do that for us? Yeah, of course, of course. So yeah, a little bit of background. This is a short little poem I wrote, kind of a stream of consciousness. It also was in Ghana, so a great place to end. When I was there last year, I reconnected with someone that I met the year before. And we just had a cute little cuddle moment. Um, Some nice music was playing. And I think I literally like wrote this on my notes app as it was happening or right after it happened. So yeah, here goes. (laughs) Um, Could have laid in your arms forever. Numb in these moments with you. Miguel singing us to sleep feels like we met in another lifetime. There's no way that love only exists on my side of the Atlantic because I've loved in every corner of the world. And yeah, that's how I felt in the moment we were listening to Miguel. It was a little vibe, and I just wrote this. <laughs> oh, beautiful, beautiful. Ugh, that had such an effect on me even just now. Ooh. I want to get out there. Get on the other <laughs> side of that Atlantic. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that and being so vulnerable with us. And to tie things up with a little bow, how can people keep up with you? Yeah, so folks can keep up with me on Instagram and TikTok. My handle is Brie, B-R-I-R-E-A-R-I, poetry. Um, Yeah, I have a blog. (laughs) You can find it in my Instagram bio, but I'm mostly on Instagram and TikTok, a little bit of Twitter. And yeah. Lovely. And if you want to travel with Brie, get on that buoyant trip, you guys. Spots are going soon, I presume. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, so folks can like follow Buoyant on Instagram. It's buoyant, B-U-O-Y-A-N-T dot travel. And yes, you have to book our Ghana trip soon because we only got a few months. And basically, I'm going to close the bookends like mid-November. So if you want to come, stop playing. (laughs) <laughs> get on it yes. get on it you don't play with new year's eve y'all no. we know this <laughs> well thank you guys for tuning in so much we'll be back soon and you know we'll catch you on the flip side Enchanté. to keep up with briari and all the amazing projects she's up to be sure to follow her on social media at briari poetry want to link up with like-minded globe thotties all over the world find your squad by joining globe thotters facebook travel group Our Facebook group is a private space to ask all your travel cues, swap stories, and meet up with other adventurers on your wavelength. And did I mention it's our spring group trip HQ? Yeah, 
you're not going to want to miss that globe thoughties. Find the link to join the group in this episode's description or by simply searching globe thought or travel gang on Facebook. And while you're at it, be sure to subscribe to the pod to get globe thoughters next episode delivered straight to you. Let's wrap things up with a juicy voicemail straight off the globe thoughter hotline. To set the scene, Jenna's story takes place in Taiwan, where we find her on a steamy double date. Don't you just love it when they've got a friend for your friend too? And they both drive motorcycles? Yeah, it doesn't get much better than that, does it? Hey, my name's Jenna. So my story is in Taiwan. I drove to the East Coast with a friend that I met on Bumble BFF. Uh, We were very close very quickly and we rented a scooter. We're driving up the mountains and we got a little lost. We asked a farmer for directions and out of the corner of my eye, I see this young boy sprinting to find us. He was really cute and he insisted that we add his number onto our phones and he gave us directions to this really cool river we could swim in and my friend was texting him all day and so the next day we meet up with him for drinks and he drives us in his car and he brought a friend for me and it just felt very natural very quickly we were drinking on the beach having a lot of fun decided the next morning that we would meet up again and the boys showed up on these sexy motorcycles like the hottest thing you can imagine. And they were going very, very fast, but I just felt very safe. And (laughs) they took us to a mystery location. Yes, I know it sounds very dangerous, but I promise you I'm strong and I could fight them off. I played rugby anyways. And they brought us to this hike. And at the top of the hike was a very secluded waterfall. And we spent the day swimming, maybe a little skinny dipping and had the best time of our lives. Inspired to share your own epic travel story on the Globe Thotter hotline? All you gotta do is go to speakpipe.com slash globethotter to leave an up to 90 second voicemail detailing your travel tale. A quickie, if you will. Want to stay anonymous? No name is required to leave a voicemail. Till next time, I'm Cassie Martinez.